All right, in this brief presentation, we're going to consider the, um, the, um, the subject of satire in this um this new age that we're that we're getting into in, in this uh in this course uh that's sometimes called the age of reason or the age of enlightenment um this is the age in which that you know ultimately culminates in things like the american revolution and the french revolution and it's marked by a number of things which we'll explore but it's it's um <clears throat> it's it's a it's a culmination of, of a lot of stuff that we've seen um coming already um an age of humanism uh, a move away from kind of the group and towards the individual, a kind of a leveling of the playing field um, in terms of kind of understanding uh, what it is to be um, uh, a, a, hum a human being worthy of respect and worthy of value. All of the stuff that we saw uh, kind of germinating in the Renaissance and into the Baroque period and the like, and and um, understanding kind of our place in the universe um, uh, in a more kind of scientific way, a move away from kind of the mysticism of medievalism. All of that is <coughs> it un underlies the stuff where. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're looking at here uh, today, and one of the things that that kind of marks this era, um, and it's definitely um, at the at the foundation of things like the American Revolution and the French Revolution, is this suspicion of kings, the suspicion of royalty, and uh, a rejection of this idea that kings, European kings, rule because God has chosen them to be in that um, in that position, and so um, it's a complete undercutting of that idea. And that's what uh, really kind of foments this, uh, these ideas, uh, these revolutions that are kind of uh, grounded in the ideals of equality uh, of humanity. And w with all, you know, the, the, the warts and problems with that and, and the miscues, of course, that are embedded in that, the ideal is one of uh, inequality, uh, uh, democracy, or fraternity, liberty. Um, and uh, that's a world that has no place for, for kings, so to speak. And so satire... Um, uh, is a it, it's it emerges as, as a as a potent weapon during this 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 time period um, and during the enlightenment um, you know satire humor sarcasm uh, becomes a um, a weapon against the against the mighty and and um, again kind of like in the Renaissance it's a hearkening back to the ancient Greeks so uh, this this um, this picture I just pulled up here. Uh, this is a, a frontispiece of a, of a famous ancient Greek comedy, which is now, you know, uh, from our point of view, about 2,500 years old. Um, the Greeks were all were doing this this kind of thing as well. Lysistrata is this famous um, play in which uh, the women of Athens bec become so fed up with this ongoing war with the Spartans um, that they decide to go on a sex strike, and they basically says, "We're not going to sleep with you anymore." Uh, unless you throw down your weapons and bring this war to an end, and um, so they completely, in the ridiculousness of this play, they they uh, they uh, completely undo the men. The the, the men are become so uh, kind of sexually frustrated that ultimately they give in and decide to end the war. Um, but it was a a really uh, striking act of satire, really kind of poking fun and ridiculing the kind of the military. Uh, and violent nature of conflict at the time and taking dead aim at the people who ran society and um, you know, kind of presented kind of military conquest as the ultimate good. You see kind of again a return to that during this this era. And so satire, um, humor, irony, exaggeration, ridicule, um, pointing out you know, incongruity, um, um, you know, imbalance, um, unequalness is uh, through literature, through magazine and newspaper pieces, through cartoons, as we'll see, you take aim against institutions and individuals that uh, uh, appear ridiculous now in this age of, uh, of burgeoning equality. And so I, I asked you, uh, for this week, you read uh, Jonathan Swift's uh, A Modest Proposal, in which he uses kind of um, what we still kind of recognize as kind of a dry British irony. Um, you know, presenting something as serious when it's meant to be, of course, uh, at root ridiculous, um, of of critiquing uh, society and critiquing um, kind of the, the the way that the the poor are dealt with and treated in society. It really in the in the in the um, in the European tradition, at least in the English tradition, it begins with Swift, and then um, it goes on to Alexander Pope, Voltaire, 
during the French Revolution is the great satirist. And all of this lays the foundation for the great American uh, satirist like Ben here. So we're going to look at, at a couple of, of guys here just briefly to illustrate this. Um, we see some of the first kind of political cartooning um, during this era. Now, a lot of it, as we'll see, is, is very heavy handed, very moralistic and, um, you know, to the modern eye seems uh, kind of uh, really over the top. But um, uh, William Hogarth, you can see his, his dates here, you know, kind of roughly bracketed by the, the 18th century. He dies, you know, um, uh, just a little bit before the, the American Revolution. Um, he was a, uh, a British satirist who was an accomplished painter. You can see here, um, this is a, a self-portrait of his. He was an accomplished painter in his own right. Um, but he made his name as uh, as a kind of an early political cartoonist, um, painting, drawing this uh, sequential art pieces um, and using various media uh, to kind of critique society and um, often, like I said, in a very heavy handed moralistic kind of way. So I want to show you, uh, kind of walk you through a, kind of a famous one. And I have a little script that I'm reading from here that kind of that, that goes through each of these pictures. But one of the famous ones that he was a, that he's a known for is this called a rake's progress. So a rake, that's kind of a British -y term for someone who's he has too much money. Uh, then he knows what to do with, um, wastes his money on, on, on booze and on drugs and on sex and that kind of thing. And so it was this series of drawings, etchings, um, that, um, that he, that he, um, he critiques that kind of, of lifestyle. And so he shows uh, kind of uh, the, the story, the decline and fall of this of the character here, Thomas Rakewell. It's not a very clever name, but he um, he tells through this this kind of storyboard. He kind of tells the decline of this man who starts off promising, but then kind of gives into his vices, and he shows what happens to someone when they give into these kind, kinds of things. So I'll walk you through this just as kind of a famous example of, of kind of an early uh, satirical critique. Uh, kind of an early political cartoon um, as it would have um, presented itself, you know, here, you know, almost 300, 300 years ago. So here's the, there's a, it's a sequence of, of, of eight drawings. So in the first one here, uh, Tom, here's our, here's our hero here, Thomas Rakewell. He's come into his fortune on, to, on the death of his miserly father. And while the servants mourn, um, he is measured for new clothes and although he has a common law marriage uh, w with her, he now rejects the hand of his pregnant fiance, um, uh, Sarah Young. Here, so uh, uh, who he promised to marry, she holds his ring, and her mother holds his uh, his his love letters. You see in her in her pouch here. Um, he will pay her off, but it's clear that she still loves him. Evidence of of his father's miserliness abound. Um, his portrait above the fireplace shows him counting money. Right here. So his father was very careful with money. His father has died. Now Tom gets all the money. Now well, the idea is, will he follow his his father's um, uh, um, carefulness? Will he be um, prudent like his father? It already shows that he's making some bad decisions. Um, he, there are uh, symbols of hospitality. A jack and a spit have been locked up um, at the upper right. Um, uh, up here, I think. Um, uh, the coat of arms shows three clamped vices and the, with the motto, beware, over here. Uh, a half-starved half cat reveals the father kept little food in the house. See the skinny cat down here. Um, and while the lack of ashes in the fireplace uh, demonstrates that he rarely spent money for wood to heat his home. The engraving at the right shows the father went so far as to resole shoes from a leather cover from a Bible so as not to pay the shoemaker for uh, repairs. So his father was really, really, really stingy um, and washed his, 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 his money. So when he dies, he leaves a tonny, ton of money left to Thomas here. Painting two. In the second painting, Tom is at his morning uh, meetings in London. Attended by musicians and other hangers-on, all dressed in expensive costumes. Surrounding Tom, left to right, a music master at a harpsichord, who is supposed to represent George Frederick Handel, right here. Um, a fencing master, right here. Uh, a quarterstaff instructor, right here. Uh, a dancing master with a, uh, a violin. Um, yeah, here he is with a violin in his hand. Uh, a, a landscape gardener, uh, Charles Bridgman, an ex-soldier offering to be a bodyguard, a bugler of a fox hunt. At lower right is a jockey with a silver trophy. 
Um, the quarter staff instructor looks disapprovingly on both the fencing and dancing masters. Both masters appear to be in the French style, which is a subject Hogarth loads. So you kind of this, this English disdain for um, kind of French um, um, fanciness, frippery, as it were. Upon the wall between the paintings of the roosters, emblems of cockfighting, again, a, a kind of a, um, a debauched, kind of ridiculous uh, pursuit. Uh, you see the painting of the Judgment of Paris, this famous um, scene from Greek mythology where Paris gives the golden apple to the goddess Aphrodite, showing that he's kind of enslaved to the power of love and lust. So um, Thomas is already going down the, the bad path. He's giving into the the sensual pleasures, the, um, the, the pleasures of, of the rich. He's not following his father's example at all. All right. Painting three depicts a wild party or orgy underway at a brothel. Um, the prostitutes are stealing uh, the, the drunken Tom's watch. Uh, so he's, here's um, Tom, he's all drunk, and the prostitutes are taking advantage of him. On the floor at the bottom right is a night watchman's staff. Um, I don't see it. Down, I guess down here, it'd be the bottom left. Um, a lantern souvenirs of Tom's wild night of the town. The scene takes place at the Rose Tavern, a famous brothel in Convent Garden. The prostitutes have black spots on their faces, see right there, um, which uh, to cover syphilitic sores. So he's kind of, again, giving himself into lust, gambling, sex, uh, drink. He's throwing it all away. Painting four, um, oh, William, or sorry, uh, Tom narrowly escapes his arrest for debt by the bailiffs uh, as he travels in a sedan chair to a party at St. James Palace to celebrate Queen Caroline's birthday. On this occasion, he's saved by the intervention of Sarah Young. This is the woman that he intended to marry, um, but rejected. But she's still a good, uh, a good woman, and she comes to his rescue. Um, in comic relief, a man filling a street lantern spills the oil on Tom's head, right here. Um, this is a sly reference to how blessings on a person were accompanied by oil poured on the head. In this case, the blessing being the saving of Tom by Sarah. Although Rakewell, being a rake, will not take the moral lesson to heart. In the engraved version, lightning flashes in the sky, right there. Uh, and a young pickpocket has just emptied Tom's pocket, um, right there. He's being being robbed. Um, the painting, however, shows the young thief stealing Tom's cane and has no, uh, has no lightning. Painting five. In the fifth, Tom attempts to salvage his fortune, here's Tom again, by marrying a rich but an old and um, unattractive old maid at St. Marleybone. In the background, Sarah arrives back here, um, holding their child, um, while an indignant um, mother struggles with a guest. It looks as though Tom's eyes are already upon the pretty maid to his new wife's left during the nuptials, right? So he's he's marrying this this older woman here, but he also seems to, he's already looking at the younger girl. So um, again, Tom is not in the in the in the right place painting six uh the sixth painting shows tom pleading for the assistance of the almighty praying to god in a gambling den at soho's white club after losing all of his new fortune neither he nor the obsessive gamblers seem to be have noticed a fire uh breaking out uh behind them so uh now he's desperate he's lost everything and um can't even be um can be bothered to see the uh th threats of of mortal danger behind him painting seven all is lost. Tom's incarcer incarcerated um, in the notorious Fleet Debtors Prison. He ignores the distress of both his angry new slash old wife and faithful Sarah, who cannot help him this time. Um, both the, uh, the beer boy, as he's called, and the jailer demand money from him. Tom begins to go mad, as indicated both a telescope for celestial observation poked out of the barred window right here. Um, in apparent reference to the longitude rewards offered by the British government, and an alchemy experiment in the background, back here. Um, uh, Tom, beside Tom is a rejected uh, play, so he, he's, he's maybe attempting again to, uh, to write, but can't get anything published. Another inmate is writing a pamphlet on how to solve the national debt. Above the bed at the right is an apparatus for wings, up here, uh, which is clearly seen in the engraved version. Um, up here, uh, maybe a reference to kind of the Daedalus and Icarus story in, um, in in Greek mythology, which were used to escape prison, but here they're kind of been put up on a shelf, um, completely useless. And then the last painting, down here, he's a madman, finally insane and violent. Uh, he ends his days in Bedlam Hospital, 
London's famous, infamous mental asylum. Only Sarah Young is there to comfort him. Uh, but Rakewell continues to ignore her. While some of the details in these pictures may appear disturbing to modern eyes, they were commonplace in Hogarth's day. For example, the fashionably dressed women, fashionably dressed women in this last painting um, have come to the asylum as a social occasion to be entertained by the bizarre antics of the inmates. So we know that people came just down to the, the, the mental ward to laugh at the people in their mental illness. So all of this, again, like so I said, you know, heavily moralistic, heavy-handed. Um, the idea is kind of a wagging finger is that this is what will happen to you if you, you know, follow down the devil's ro road of womanizing, uh, drink, and, um, and uh, you know, wasting your money. And there's also, kind of, again, this kind of this idealization of the purity of womanhood, too. I think that goes back to kind of almost the medieval era of chivalry. Is Sarah Young, I mean, she has no, um, you know, uh, no logical reason to care for him anymore. He's treated her awfully through all of, all of this. But she uh, being tr stays true to him through all of this, even caring for him as he descends into, into madness. Um, here's another one of his, uh, again, the same kind of idea all wrapped up in... Um, in uh, in one painting, uh, Beer Lane and Gin Street, some seventeen fifty one, again shows what happens to society when they when they give themselves over to uh, um, the hard drink. The idea here is here, over here is Beer Lane, and here is Gin Street, and so the idea is that beer is an acceptable drink. Um, that is uh, you know part and parcel of civilized society. You know, go down to the pub and have a good beer, so you can drink beer and you can still you can still paint. And you can still uh, you can have a good time and take care of one another in a in a loving kind of way. You can still be productive um, and you'll bring things to the market and bring things home from the market. But over here, Gin Street, Gin, um, the demon, uh, the demon booze, and this is what happens. You know, civilization just falls apart. Um, you know, this this kind of mad drunken woman even um, doesn't even notice when her own child goes flying over the railing here in this kind of ridiculous fashion. You're kind of competing with the dogs for bones and for food. So again, a very kind of uh, moralistic view uh, of society and what is proper and what is improper behavior. Um, all right, lastly here, another um, another figure uh, doing a similar kind of thing a bit later, uh, kind of a generation after Hogarth, Hogarth, is James Gilray, who's sometimes called the father of the political cartoon. And whereas Hogarth would, would went after kind of the vices of society, uh, Gilray went right after uh, kings and politicians themselves. And so um, he was most famous for kind of going after King George III, who was the, uh, again, the king of, uh, of Britain during the time of the American Revolution, and then also Napoleon. In the early 19th century, um, the King Emperor of France, um, who uh, can, on the heels of really on the heels of the French Revolution, um, built a, uh, a, a French uh, empire for a, a short period of time. So, yeah, he's famous for his wit, his humor, his style, his realism, his sense of the absurd. Lots of stuff we still see as hallmarks of kind of British humor today. Um, a lot of them, they don't really read very well today. I mean, it's one of, like a lot of political cartoons. If you're not steeped in what's going on at the time, then it's very difficult to appreciate the kind of the humor of it. Um, and and it, it's the kind of thing if, if you if you need to explain a joke, the joke no, is no longer funny. But we're so we're so sorry, so far removed from these things culturally and um, and historically that they don't present ourselves they don't present themselves obviously to us. So this is a, a famous one from Gilray, uh, 1792, connoisseur examining a Cooper. So this is a uh, a kind of a caricature, a satire of King um, George the Third. He's squinting um, at a portrait of Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell was a um, this a revolutionary who overthrew the British monarchy for a short period of time, and and it, so it becomes kind of a symbol of, of Cromwell becomes a, a, a symbol of the threat. Uh, to any monarch, the instability of the place of any monarch, and so George uh, the Third, uh, with his bad eyesight, kind of has trouble even kind of recognizing perhaps the danger in front of him. Um, his uh, uh, he has this elaborate gold candlestick, but on the top of it was called a save all, um, which was a way of um, uh, so you have this elaborate candlestick, but it's supporting kind of a poor person's uh, candlestick, a save all, a thing that you would have to kind of save as much wax to make a candle last as long as possible. So we see kind of George is a ridiculous person. He has all the money of the monarchy at, at his at his disposal, but he's still very very stingy 
um, you know, keeping an eye on every last drip of wax that he can reuse to uh, to, to light his candle. Um, so the the context of this of this of this cartoon, the king of Sweden had recently been murdered. Um, the monarchy was threatened in France, so there's kind of a you know, revolution is 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 uh, is building. And the idea is that George is completely oblivious. He has no idea what's going on. He has no idea kind of how uh, tenuous his own circumstances. So he's kind of squinting, squinting at Cromwell, who re represents kind of the overthrowing of the monarchy. And he's like, he's going, huh? What does this mean? So that's kind of the idea. So, but uh, get, recognize kind of the, the freedom of a British subject of this king being able to draw and publish and, and make the king look so stupid, ridiculous, and stingy, uh, cheap, uh, and short-sighted uh, is a leap forward in terms of um, uh, you know, freedom of the press um, and the rights of the individual. Here's another one where um, Gilray um, uh, kind of pokes fun at, uh, at Napoleon, uh, who gives this mocking name, uh, Titty Doll. Uh, which is, uh, I don't fully understand it myself, but it's a, it's a, it's a name. Even the sound of it kind of, you know, sounds infantilizing. Titty doll, the great French uh, gingerbread maker. So it, it, uh, it mocks kind of Napoleon, kind of marching throughout Europe and establishing uh, these kings, making a show of saying, "Oh yes, I'll let you kind of run your own countries, and I'll let you, you know, control your own populace. I'm just here to kind of provide guidance." But of, of course. That was, uh, nothing was further from the truth. Uh, Napoleon was there to conquer and to rule. So he's depicted as kind of baking these kings as gingerbread figures. He's fully in control. He's the one adding the ingredients. He's the one um, uh, kind of calling all the shots under the kind of the auspices of, of just allowing them to continue to run their show. So he, he, um, he depicts him as this baker who's um, kind of cynically using uh, kind of political language and lies and, um, uh, and deception to have his way. So, so like I said, it's 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 hard to kind of get the joke when we're so far removed from these kinds of things. But I hope you at least saw through these examples, um, kind of the uh, what satire looked like in this day and age, what it was trying to do, critiquing society, critiquing politics. We're seeing um, a kind, of, kind of the rise of the little man. We're seeing the rise of the individual. And we're kind of seeing the kind of the bringing down the great powers, um, the rulers, the emperors down to, er down to earth and using the power of comedy, wit, humor, irony, incongruity to, um, to level the playing field and to um, uh, pull the rug out from underneath them. All right, more next time.